Hello everybody, it's me your doctor friend Siddharth and today we are going to talk about benign prosthetic hypoplasia or BPH. In the part 1 video, we discussed about the basic concept of the prostate gland and now in the part 2 video, we will be talking about the clinical concept of the BPH. The link to the part 1 video is given below in the video description and also in the top right corner of your screen. Let us start this presentation with the etiology of BPH. BPH, as the name suggests, is a benign neoplasm, also known as fibromyoadenoma. It has been found that greater than 80% of the men above the age of 80 will develop this condition. So this is also the part of the aging process. The conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone is mainly responsible as with the A's, the TS level drops slowly. However, the fall of estrogen is not proportionate to the fall of testosterone level. This results in higher estrogen level in aging men. Now this excess of estrogen sensitizes prosthetic tissue more to the dihydrotestosterone. BPH arises from the submucosal glands of periurethral transition zone with stromal proliferation and adenosis. It eventually compresses the peripheral zone and enlarges as lateral lobe. This is the figure taken from Robin's pathology. Here we have shown the stromal cells and the epithelial cells of the prostate gland. In the stromal cells, we have the special enzyme called 5 alpha reductase type 2. The testosterone hormone will be converted by this 5 alpha reductase type 2 to dihydrotestosterone. This dihydrotestosterone will act on the androgen receptors both of the stromal cells and the epithelial cells and will lead to the formation of the growth factors, fibroblast growth factors, FGF, or transforming growth factors, TGF, which will act in the autocrine or the paracrine fashion. These growth factors are mitogenic to both stromal and epithelial cells responsible for the hyperplasia of the prostate glands. What are the consequences that occurs because of this? The median lobe enlarges into the bladder as has been shown in this figure. The lateral lobe narrows the urethra causing the obstruction. Urethra above the verimentinum gets elongated. The bladder because of the BPH will initially take the pressure by itself and it will lead to the trabeculation and saculation and lateron diverticular formation in the bladder. The enlarged prostate will also compress the prostatic venous plexus and it will lead to the vesicle piles that might lead to hematuria. Kidney and ureter back pressure will develop hydroureter and hydronephrosis. This hydroureter and hydronephrosis, if severe enough, will lead to the obstructive uropathy with renal failure. Secondary ascending infection can also occur because of the urinary retention and that might lead to the pyelonephritis. And the BPH can also cause impotence. This is the diagram taken from Nators at last. Here, because of the BPH, the median bar has extended into the bladder and obstructed the bladder outlet. This leads to the urinary tension and results in the atonic thin walled markedly distended bladder. Because of the median lobe hypertrophy, in the cystoscopic view, the bladder wall will be obstructed by the median bar. What are the changes that occur because of this condition? BPH will lead to the bladder outlet obstruction and will result in the lower urinary tract symptoms also known as LUTs. The symptoms of LUTs can be classified as the symptoms of voiding and the symptoms of storage. Symptoms of voiding include dribbling even after maturation, intermittent stream that stops and starts, poor bladder emptying, episodes of near retention, straining not improving the flow, and hesitancy. The symptoms of storage includes urgency, nocturia, frequency, urge incontinence, and nocturnal incontinence. The mnemonics to memorize symptoms of voiding is the pace voids, and the mnemonics to memorize symptoms of storage is the unfun store. What is International Prostate Symptom Score? International Prostate Symptom Score, or IPSS, is a screening tool for BPH. It is an eight question screening tool which includes seven symptom related questions and one quality of life question. It was created in 1992 by American Neurological Association and previously we used to call this IPSS score as a AUA score or American Neurological Association Symptom Score because it originally lacked this eighth question also known as the quality of life question. 
The seven symptoms which we are describing in IPSS include feeling of incomplete bladder emptying, frequency, intermittency, urgency, weak stream, straining and nocturia. Each of these seven symptoms are referred to during the last month and each symptoms will have the score from 1 to 5. So 7 into 5 there is a total of 35 points and the 8th question that is a quality of life question has a score of 1 to 6. Out of these 35 points we can classify the patient as being mildly symptomatic if the score is 0 to 7, moderately symptomatic if the score is 8 to 19 and severely symptomatic if the score is 20 to 35. Digital rectal examination is very important part of the clinical examination in BPH and it is a very important clinical method to differentiate BPH from CA prostate. Digital rectal examinations on BPH will have the following findings. The gland will be enlarged, form rubbery and lobulated and it will be homogeneous in consistency. The gland will be non-tender and the two lateral lobes of the gland can be filled to bulge into rectum divided by the central sulcus. And the rectal mucosa over the gland will move freely on CA prostate, the gland is hard, nodular, irregular and heterogeneous in consistency. The medial sulcus, which we are describing here, will be obliterated in case of CA prostate. The rectal mucosa will be tethered to the gland, so it cannot move freely over the gland unlike in BPS. The tissues lateral to the gland may be infiltrated, giving rise to the winging of the prostate. What are the investigations you send to diagnose the case of BPH? The investigations can be categorized as the laboratory investigations and imaging. The laboratory investigations include urine, RME and CS. The routine medical examination of urine will help to detect hematuria and culture and sensitivity will help to detect if there is any urinary tract obstruction. The renal function test RFT which includes sodium, potassium, urea and creatinine will help to identify if there is any obstructive uropathy features. Prostate specific antigen, acid phosphatase and urodynamics we will discuss in the subsequent slides. In the imaging, we can do USC abdomen and pelvis, France rectal ultrasound which are not done routinely, IVU or intravenous urography to see kidney function and cystoscopy. However, in our clinical setting, we usually prefer to do only USC abdomen and pelvis. Prostate specific antigen. There has been a lot of talks ongoing about PSA whether or not to use it as a part of investigation in BPH and its sensitivity and specificity. We have already discussed that it is a androgen regulated serine proteases produced from prostatic epithelium that are secreted in semen. The normal value of PSA is less than 4 nanogram per ml of plasma. The PSA elevation occurs in carcinoma, BPH or prostatitis. If the PSA is greater than 10 nanogram per ml, then that is significant and is suggestive of CA prostate and if it is greater than 35 nanogram per ml, then that is almost diagnostic of advanced carcinoma. The serial estimation of PSA is useful to suspect spread and recurrence after treatment, and the decrease in PSA after therapy suggests adequate ablation. Acid phosphatase. As the name suggests, it is the enzyme that splits organic phosphatase, and it gets activated in acidic pH. They are found in many human tissues, but they are found to be more concentrated in prostate gland. They are secreted by prostate and it drains into urethra through prostatic ducts. And this is why the blood level of this enzyme is very low. The normal acid phosphatase level is 0 to 5 King Armstrong unit per 100 ml of serum and it is raised significantly in carcinoma prostate with metastasis. However, it does not increase in BPH. They are slightly raised in acute prostatitis, Paget disease of bone and hepatic cirrhosis. In urodynamics, we talk about urine flow rate and voiding pressure. The urine flow rate is for a voided volume of greater than 200 ml. If the urine flow rate is greater than 15 ml per second, then that is normal. And if it is less than 10 ml per second, that is low. If the voiding pressure is less than 60 cm of water, that is normal. And if the voiding pressure is greater than 80 cm of water, that is high. The low urine flow rate and the high voiding pressure is the sign of bladder outlet obstruction. In this urodynamic dress, we have shown what the bladder outflow obstruction looks like. This stress has been taken from billion lob sort practice of surgery. Here in the upper part is the detrusive pressure and in the lower part is the flow rate. The detrusive pressure is the voiding pressure is in excess of 120 centimeter of water and the flow rate is below 10 ml per second. This is the classic picture of bladder outflow obstruction. Now let's talk about the management of BPH. First thing first, if the patient has got acute retention of urine, urethral catheterization is the must. 
and if urethral catheterization is not possible, then suprapubic cystostomy is to be done. If the patient has got chronic retention of urine but has presented with the features of uremia, then to prevent further obstructive damage, the catheterization is also must in this case. And in patient of uremia, it is also important to correct serum electrolytes. Conservative management can be done in mild cases of BPH. It includes diet modification and medications. Diet should be low in fat and red meat and high in proteins and vegetables. This has been propounded from the data of the prostate cancer prevention trial. Medications are necessary for mild to moderate symptoms and it includes 5-alpha reductase inhibitors and alpha blockers. 5-alpha reductase inhibitors inhibits conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. This will lead to the decrease in the size of prostate gland. However, these group of drugs are very slow to act and we can access the response only after 12 weeks to 6 months of treatment. The drug include finasteride, 5-MG per oral 4 times a day and the side effect of this drug are erectile dysfunction, decreased libido, breast enlargement and retrograde ejaculation in the decreasing order of frequency. The other group of drug alpha blockers will relax the bladder neck muscle and muscle fibers in the prostate making urination easier. We generally use tamsulosin in this category because it is most pharmacologically uroselective drug. Tamsulosin should be given 0.4 mg per oral once a day and it should be given 30 minutes after same meal each day. If response is inadequate, we can increase the dose to 0.8 mg once a day after 2 to 4 weeks. The side effect of this drug is headache, retrograde ejaculation, orthostatic hypotension and dizziness. So we should always instruct the patient not to get up from the bed or from sitting postures immediately and to drink lot of fluids. The other is the combination therapy of 5-alpha reductase inhibitor and alpha blockers. In such combination therapy, we use a capsule that contains deuteresteride 0.5 mg and tamsulosin 0.4 mg. Operative management. When to do operative management? It is done when there is increased frequency of maturation, dysuria, increased urgency, unable to urinate, nocturia, and acute retention of urine with residual urine more than 200 ml. It is done in the condition where there is the complications of BPH like hydronephrosis and recurrent urinary tract infections. It can also be done in case of obstructive uropathy after the correction of obstructive uropathy features. There are various minimally invasive surgeries performed in case of BPH and they are transurethral resection of prostate TURP, transurethral incision of prostate TUIP, holmium laser inoculation of prostate OLEP, transurethral microwave thermotherapy TUMT, transurethral needle ablation of the prostate TUNA and high intensity ultrasound energy therapy. Among these, the gold standard and academically most important is the TURP and we will only discuss TURP in the next slides. Transurethral resection of prostate. In this procedure, we use a lighted scope transurethrally and we resect the prostate gland except the outer part. This will help to remove symptoms very quickly and the patient might temporarily need a catheter to drain the bladder postoperatively. Since we also need hemostasis postoperatively, we inflate the balloon of Foley's catheter from 30 to 40 ml in case of TURP, unlike 10 ml which we use routinely. In this procedure, we need irrigation fluid. This irrigation fluid ideally should be transparent for good visibility, electrically non-conductive, isotonic, non-toxic, non-hemolytic when absorbed, easy to sterilize and inexpensive. However, such ideal irrigation fluid is not available. The best available irrigation fluid in our clinical setting is glycine 1.5% in water. Patients usually absorb around 20 ml per minute and the average absorption during a case is approximately 1.5 liter. This absorption of irrigation fluid intraoperatively depends upon the pressure of infusion, venous pressure and duration of irrigation. Let's talk about the complication of TURP. It has got local complications like hemorrhage, perforation of bladder or the prostatic capsule, sepsis, urethral stricture, bladder neck contracture, incontinence if the resection exits beyond verumentanum, retrograde ejaculation and impotence, occasionally following overaggressive resection of small prostate, reoperation, as it is now well known that after 8 years, 15 to 18 percent of the men with BPS will need reoperation, and general complication includes TURP syndrome. I will talk in particular about TURP syndrome in the subsequent slides. TURP syndrome is the fluid overlaid and isosmolar hyponatremia that can lead to CCF during TURP from large volume of irrigation fluid being absorbed through the venous sinuses. The clinical features of TURP syndrome includes CNS symptoms like restlessness, headache, 
nausea and vomiting, confusion, visual disturbance, cerebral edema, convulsion, and coma. Chest symptoms like bradycardia, tachypnea, hypoxia, and pulmonary edema. And miscellaneous symptoms like hypothermia, abdominal pain, and distension. The risk factor for QRP syndrome is the surgical time, which is greater than 90 minutes, height of the bag, having the irrigation fluid, greater than 90 cm, resection of the posterior gland, greater than 60 g, large amount of blood loss, perforation of bladder that lead to the rapid absorption from the peritoneal cavity, large amount of the fluid used, and poorly controlled CHF as a comorbidity. Let's talk about pathophysiology of TURP syndrome. In TURP syndrome, because of the high volume absorption of the irrigation fluid, the fluid overload will cause volume expansion, and that will lead to the hypertension. The fluid overload will also lead to dilational hyponatremia and it will decrease plasma oncotic pressure. This hypotension and decreased plasma oncotic pressure will lead to the pulmonary edema and cerebral edema. Heat loss due to irrigation is responsible for hypothermia. And as we all know, glycine can be converted to glycolic acid and ammonia. This hyperammonemia is responsible for encephalopathy. Thank you.